There are 16 Berlins on the world map, 11 in the United States alone. But there's only one city of that name with a population of millions, a Berlin most everyone has heard of, the one located in the heart of Germany. Right in the middle of Europe, Berlin, the divided city, symbolic of a divided people. A wall slicing through the metropolis separates west from east. The eastern part of the city is under Soviet responsibility. In the west, there are a French, a British, and an American sector. Berlin is situated like an island inside East Germany, fenced in by communist barbed wire, with which the Eastern regime prevents people from fleeing to the West. And there are wide open no man's lands and ditches, illuminated at night by spotlights, watchtowers, soldiers, and cutting through Berlin, the insurmountable wall. It separates the citizens of East Berlin from freedom which is cherished in West Berlin as much as in Iowa, California, Florida, or Washington. This freedom is guaranteed by treaties and protected by the troops of the Western Allies. The Americans shoulder the greatest burden. Berlin lies idyllically in the midst of forests and lakes, a metropolis surrounded by nature. The American sector is particularly green. Responsibility for the security of the two million West Berliners is borne not by the city administration, but by the three allied city commandants. We meet Major General Calvert P. Benedict in front of his headquarters. Our presence in Berlin is very simply to maintain the freedom of this great city. We stand for freedom for all peoples in the world. By our presence in Berlin after World War II, we made a commitment to the German people that we would give them an opportunity for a democratic government and a democratic way of life. For the 35 years since World War II, the communists have brought great pressure on us to leave the city, and had we done so, we would have turned two million Berliners over to a communist way of life without political, spiritual, or intellectual freedom and no hope for the future. By our continued presence in Berlin, we have fulfilled our commitment and we have perpetuated the freedom of West Berlin. Berlin, May 1945. The Soviets had conquered the city. What General Benedict said is based on the agreements concluded before the end of the war. The victorious powers had decided to jointly occupy the former capital of Germany. In Yalta, in February of 1945, Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill confirmed these agreements. Six months later, Truman, Stalin, and British Prime Minister Attlee met in Potsdam. They agreed that Berlin be divided into four sectors and initially governed jointly. But it was not long before the Soviets attempted to exert more influence on the city. In 1948, the East-West conflict came to a head, a total Soviet blockade of West Berlin. General Lucius D. Clay set up a gigantic airlift to keep supplies coming in. In over 270,000 flights between June of 1948 and May of 1949, American and British military planes flew in more than two million tons of food, coal, and industrial goods to West Berlin. It took almost a full year for the Soviets to abandon the blockade. Because in the following years, up to 5,000 people were fleeing every day from East Germany to West Berlin. 
on August 13, 1961, the communist regime put up the wall. To this very day, the wall remains a symbol of inhumanity known to the entire world and closely identified with Berlin. It appeared that the Western Allies were powerless to prevent the wall, or at least didn't want to risk an all-out confrontation over it. John F. Kennedy immediately dispatched his Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson to Berlin. He himself came personally on June 26, 1963, and over one and a half million Berliners gave him the most triumphant welcome in the history of the city. Here in front of City Hall, President Kennedy spoke what were to become legendary words. Today, in the world of freedom, the proudest boast is, Ich bin ein Berliner. Beginning with Harry S. Truman, American presidents and vice presidents in visiting the divided city and reiterating the guarantees for the safety of the citizens of the Western sectors. The Control Council Building, symbol of the four power status of Berlin as a whole, on which the rights and responsibilities of the Western Allies are based. A flourishing economy is developed under the umbrella of Western Allied protection and the inhabitants of the largest industrial city between Paris and Moscow are quite aware of who makes it possible for them to live in freedom and lead socially secure lives. Let's listen for ourselves. One question. What do you think of the Americans in Berlin, both civilian and military presence? Well, I would be happier if they could be here just as civilians, as tourists or such. Uh, but seeing the situation around Berlin, I think it's better we have some uh, American soldiers here, too. Well, the older Berliners who've been here through the blockade and the Kennedy visit and the Khrushchev ultimatum, we know that only the presence of American troops is what keeps this part of the city free. I remember as a child the big airlift that kept us alive and I appreciate very much the protection the Americans give us against the Russian uh, pressure. Have you been to America? Yes, um, last year I've been in California, San Francisco, Yosemite Park, and it was very fantastic. And how about you? Have you been to America, and how did you like it? Some weeks ago to Florida, and I like the people very much. They are broad-minded and very kind to us Berlin. We've already touched on the Berlin economy. An American is now in charge of getting new business into the city. His name is Robert Layton. Our task is to promote the economic development of Berlin by attracting new industrial investment to the city and by mobilizing the uh, efficiency reserves and assisting in the expansion of Berlin manufacturing companies. We have been able in the last 15 months to attract some 40 new industrial investments to Berlin. Our latest success is the establishment of a Ford plastics manufacturing center uh, which will supply Ford of Europe's operations in Germany, Spain, and Belgium. We believe this establishes an important precedent, uh, which we intend to market in the United States, and uh, we will draw the attention to the unique Berlin advantages uh, to American enterprises. Leighton used to be the manager of Ford Germany. Today, he is busy attracting American investment to Berlin. Many U.S. companies have had their European homes in Berlin for decades. Here they can tap a large reservoir of skilled labor and benefit from favorable tax laws designed to compensate for the disadvantages of doing business in an island city. Mr. Horskotter, what are your reasons for running production facilities in Berlin? Well, besides the financial incentives, major advantages for Gillette to operate in Berlin are the existence of a highly skilled labor force, which is well-motivated, flexible, and quality productivity-minded. And furthermore, the climate of this city, which is still one of the most important industrial, educational, and cultural centers in Europe. This city offers a wide range of financial incentives to attract foreign investors, 
which enabled them in practice to establish production facilities with very little capital expenditure. Something unusual in a very unusual city. An American radio station broadcasting two programs in German around the clock. It went on the air in 1946 and is still today extremely popular in both East and West. Rios, radio in the American sector, with 650 employees and a world-renowned big band. Once a year, Rios holds a huge public festival in front of the restored Reichstag, Germany's democratic parliament, until 1933. The U.S. Brigade also participates with music and shows. Among the spectators, General Benedict and his civilian deputy, Minister David Anderson. He works for the State Department, which always staffs this post with a high-ranking diplomat. American efforts to maintain Berlin's viability are not limited only to our military and official presence here, or only to encouraging American investment in the city. We also make a significant contribution to the city's culture. Right in the downtown area, we have the much frequented America House. There's the Henry Ford Building at the Free University, set in one of Berlin's green suburban and the American Memorial Library, located in a working class district not far from the wall. There are also many American intellectuals who live and work in Berlin, professors in the universities, singers in the opera, and creative artists such as Edward Keenholz or George Rickey, whose mobile sculpture stands in front of Berlin's famous National Gallery. Furthermore, we Americans are in evidence in Berlin at festivals like our own summer Volksfest in Dahlem or at the U.S. Air Force's Tempelhof Open Door Celebration, this year visited by almost half a million Berliners. Here it becomes quite evident just how good relations are between the Berliners and their American protectors. Within just two days, a half a million people turn out to take a look at Allied planes, tanks, and other equipment. come to enjoy American hamburgers and ice cream as well. military forces day in Berlin. The three Western Allies work together smoothly, efficiently, harmoniously. Even though West Germany's political, judicial, economic, financial, and social system applies also to the West Berliners, and despite the fact the city-state maintains close ties to West Germany, the Allies nevertheless have sovereignty over the area. But they work closely together with the West German authorities. Keeping an eye on the sector border, that is, on 30 miles of wall and 71 miles of barbed wire and other insurmountable barriers is one of the most important routine jobs of the Allied forces in Berlin. As here, the wall is patrolled day and night, and it's kept under continuous observation from the air by helicopter. U.S. soldiers can also enter East Berlin, 
They regularly cross over through Checkpoint Charlie for excursions into the eastern part of the city. Since the four power status applies to Berlin as a whole, such patrols are part of the Western Allied tasks in Berlin. The Soviets, incidentally, also come to West Berlin. The German city administration provides financial support to some of the American installations in Berlin. Among them, the famous Aspen Institute. We're at the Aspen Institute, Professor Stone. What is Aspen doing in Berlin? Well, this is an institute really uh, international um, with strong American influence where we discuss the major problems of our times and we're very fortunate that we get leaders from all parts of the world and particularly, of course, Germany, uh, political leaders, economic leaders, uh, scientists to come here and discuss these problems. Thank you very much, Professor Shepard Stone. I think you're doing a great job here in Berlin. And here we have John McCoy. Well, it's very nice to be back in Berlin. Let me say a word about the Aspen Institute and its position here. I think it's wonderful that we have a sort of a window on the world from Berlin here. That's because Mr. Stone has been able to bring uh, very distinguished uh, commentators and students and scholars. It's, uh, I think, a real contribution to the life and vigor of Berlin. And I always enjoyed the mood and the courage of the Berliner. And it was always good to come here. Here we are in the foyer of the modern Berlin Opera, and here we have Catherine Gaye and Donald Grobe. You're both starring in a modern opera called Titanic, which is also to be shown in America. Uh, what is Titanic? Is that a real opera? Titanic is, first of all, an audience participation, so-called opera. And I call it a, a collage, opera, musical comedy, cabaret. And uh, you want it, you've got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a little sequence of that with you, and let's watch it. <laughs> Catherine Gay, you're working here for years at the Berlin Opera, and you're working with German colleagues and German staff, how do you get along? Well, I would say I get along with them as I would with anyone in any country. And now that I've been here so long, I finally mastered the language. <laughs> how about you, Donald Go? Oh, I definitely say the same. Um, we live here with our families, children, everything, our colleagues. Everything's just socially the same as it would be at home, I think. And uh, uh, it's a completely reciprocal thing, I think, as far as the Germans are concerned. They've even appointed me, my colleagues have appointed me the grievance man to the opera now. And uh, that shows, I think, that we're quite integrated here. But less prominent Americans feel at home in Berlin, too. For example, art gallery owner and author Mike Collins. He earns his living through the sale of books and brochures and with a snack bar in one of the city's large museums. Berliners are quite friendly to Americans, especially probably because of the fact that American GIs at the end of the war weren't uh, vengeful, but quite polite and quite friendly and passed out chewing gum to the kids as an example. That's why I call it the chewing gum syndrome. And uh, Americans can uh, certainly get along here just as well as they can in most American cities. I'm a city boy, so I like being in a city rather than uh, out in the country. And Berlin is a big city without the hectic of New York City, which is where I'm from. I just find that it's a little bit quieter here, but it's got all the things that I like about New York. Berlin is trying to rejuvenate itself, trying to become young, young again uh, with architecture, without at the same time dis destroying the old architecture, or it's trying not to as much as it can. It's a big, great problem, and it's a problem which I'm very interested in, and I'm making a contribution to. The 6,000 American soldiers in Berlin have other problems. There's the problem of money. Ten years ago, G.I. Joe got four marks for his dollar. Today, he gets less than half that amount. Sergeant Young coordinates contact, bringing Germans and Americans together. What well, makes a difference in our activities, quite a bit, as you mentioned, with that type of deflation in our dollar, we have quite a few of the American service personnel that remain in the barracks, such as McNair and Andrews. One of our missions in contact is to get the American service personnel, he or she out of the barracks and into the town to meet the Berliners and to get to know the city. 
You wouldn't believe it, but sometimes we have to go into the barracks, take them by the hand, and drag them downtown. But once we get uh, over the language barrier, they seem to find the city has an awful lot to offer. Look at it this way. Apart from the sightseeing, and, and, and Berlin has some beautiful historical buildings, Berlin is a, a center of, of German and European culture. It has a great opera, theater, museums, and exhibitions with some of the finest art on show anywhere. Music, uh, you have the, the Berlin Philharmonic, one of the finest orchestras in the world. And this city uh, attracts uh, some of the best popular music concerts with literally dozens of top American artists from the rock and jazz scene coming here every year. This is what makes Berlin such a great place to see, such a great place to be. But let Peter Case, the German president of Contact, tell you about that. Contact is a voluntary youth organization that tries to bring young Germans and Americans together for the benefit and enjoyment of everybody. We offer our members, but also everybody who is interested, uh, a special program, which has a great variety of events. The Contact Club is a valuable institution. This is where GIs can meet and talk with people and pursue their hobbies. Excursions, sporting events, sightseeing tours, visits to concerts, hikes and folk dancing are all arranged here, just to mention a few of the German-American activities. Thousands of people flock to the annual German-American Folks Festival held by the U.S. Brigade. It's the most popular public event in Berlin. And every year it has a new theme. Anyone out for a good time gets their money's worth right here. The world's best-known tennis players meet on the grounds of a German tennis club. Chris Lloyd Everett thrills the packed stadium, including guest of honor, U.S. Ambassador Walter Stissel. He enjoys forsaking Bond for a while to spend some time in Berlin, and not least of all, watching Tracy Austin play a great game. On Independence Day, the 4th of July, General Benedict holds a reception in the garden of the largest American club in Berlin and everyone invited shows up. His fellow commandants from Great Britain and France, personalities from all walks of Berlin life, business, the arts, science, politics, as well as all foreign diplomats accredited with the Allied command. And last but not least, the Soviets who place great importance on being part of the Independence Day festivities. The GIs serving in Berlin have at their disposal the best athletic facilities. Indoor swimming pools, football fields, tennis courts, a magnificent yacht club, and one of the most beautiful golf courses in Europe. It doesn't count now, the last one. No. The first one counted. The one is laying in the middle. That's right, unless this one's longer. <laughs> you guys don't get this ball back either. Free shot. I'll take that one. The first one. As a matter of fact, the U.S. colony offers just about everything one can enjoy back home. And for the children, of course, the baseball field with the coach and grandstand are what's most important. One final aerial view. This is the temporary home of some of the 15,000 odd Americans in Berlin. Little America is what the Berliners call this section of their city. 
but its supermarket, tank company, movie, housing units, schools, and a church for all denominations. This is our faith. This is the faith of the church. We are proud to profess it in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Is it your will that Daniel Everett should be baptized in the faith of the church, which we have all professed with you? And it cannot at all be excluded that this baby about to be baptized is in fact a third generation American in Berlin. <laughs>